I don't feel, uh, you know, I can uh, do a course uh, quietly, but uh, I don't, I don't feel I'm up to. Uh, so I, I still have a, a bit of a haze also. So it's. The thing has not gotten better, I mean, uh, better yet, but it should, uh, told me to. Call if not better, call if Simpson change. Anyway, <laughs> that was the... Uh, So after they have the That's an actual, I see that you're looking at, it's an actual intertwine of SL4. So that was for me the beginning of this uh, higher thing. I think I sent the copy to Arthur, I, I had only this one, and uh, it was about 15 uh, years ago or so. And, uh, yeah. So it's used from in, in lighter pink, seemingly. Right. Are those, are, are those representations of SU2? Or? No, these are SL4. You see the fundamental of SL4. Uh, the fundamentals are 1, V, which is C4, which is there, 1. Uh, v, v wedge 2, which is there, 2. And V wedge three, yes, which is three bar for physicists, yes. So, sorry, so, so you say so not the, the those are representations of SL four. Those are representations of SL four exactly, and the, the claim is that this is a, the most general kind of uh, intertwiner. This is the basis of intertwiners of SL four. And those uh, lines, which you're asking about, that you should uh, that should be uh, what uh, people in solid state study here. It's a change of, uh, but it's a mathematical version. It's a change of uh, phase. Well, the others have a zeros, which I didn't draw. Yes? So there are regions which each have, uh, which each have three coordinates. And those are actually exactly the coordinates of uh, the respective point in SL3, in the root space of SL3. So uh, there's a lot of information in this. Now let me start. Let me start by first, uh, well, apologizing a bit. I'm not in uh, uh, very good shape, but it should be all right for today. Uh, let me lift this. Maybe we'll lift it. Uh, 
a little bit and I, uh, so as not to have she shadow on the on the blackboard we leave that there and uh, let me start from the fact that uh, we had last time if we had a graph G of type AD we put here the graph G four times twice as a connection and we had a map we had some biunitary cells which were actually um, Q times, I mean, they were actually this plus this and this was an alpha plus alpha bar where alpha square plus alpha bar square plus uh, quantum 2 which is 2 cosine of pi over n was equal to 0 and so we have a braiding there are two solutions and we'll call this uh, arbitrarily chiral chiral left and chiral right which is the other one which is alpha bar times that plus alpha times the other one and uh, um, so there is always this connection and these are the only possible connections on G G with horizontal also G G now uh, what uh, one thing that we could do with these is to use them to define a uh, uh, so I'll go today, I'll try to go very fast because this is the only, uh, the last lesson in, in this kind of things as we go to uh, the higher part. But um, one way to, uh, to use this is the following. You can have the, uh, you can have uh, view G as a manifold so an edge like this is uh, let's say it, uh, dx an edge marked x and uh, we convene to mark the opposite partial x so that we can uh, we can uh, contract them with this operator so this is contraction operator this is somewhat arbitrary at the beginning but it's uh, uh, it's a useful uh, thing to have and now what you can do is take your graph which may be something like this and uh, take some uh, kind of uh, uh, path this is path on G so this is G and uh, just to keep in uh, to keep uh, the usual notation will draw these as yellow and now we can start to 
transport transport this uh, the the path on the graph so that's a geometry that we have parallel transport and uh, uh, the way to do it is transport along a pair xi1 let's put this one should be white xi1 and xi2 so the transport is not along a single path as usual imagine just because we work with matrices but it's along a pair of paths so the transport along xi1 xi2 of a path alpha is equal to the sum of coefficients times beta where the coefficient is as you can imagine exactly the one given by the discrete form of the action that we talked about before namely you fill the space between the between uh, the two uh, path with so this is here xi1 xi2 this is alpha and this is beta and uh, now you fill the space in all possible ways with uh, the inner thing and this is defined as the sum over all the intermediate edges of the product of the cells uh, where remember that this is a number this is a complex number yes and remember that this is a discrete form this is a discrete form of the integral of e to the integral of uh, l so this is the action the exponential of the integral becomes this this uh, integral product here but it's a discrete form and uh, so this way you have a notion of uh, flatness but remember that the first of all the dimension of g at a point is the Perron Frobenius eigenvector value mu at a point uh, a mu of a so it changes which gives the uh, which gives the approximate number of paths as you remember from the pass on a4 with the rabbits where we are getting the Fibonacci numbers so as a manifold here the dimension varies from one point to another for instance for the an for the a4 it's one golden ratio golden ratio one yes which is quantum one quantum two quantum three quantum four and so in any case there are more paths which is obvious of any given length there are more paths starting from here than from here yes 
So what we check is flatness. Namely, uh, if uh, uh, we check whether the trans, if xi1, if xi1, xi2 go from A to A, is a transportation along xi1, xi2 equal to the identity. That's what flatness is. On a manifold, you transport things around, back, and you check. So if it is, that would be equivalent to uh, the fact that if you transport uh, it, uh, the identity, yes, including here, there's a delta of uh, xi1, xi2 times the identity. Uh, this includes, uh, in that case, you can transport xi along xi, xi alpha to a flat field of, vector, of tensors. Yes, so the paths are viewed as tensors. They actually, they have more structure than tensors, the path, because tensors would mean individual edges, Cartesian product of things. Paths have also connections at vertices between edges, which are very important. So, uh, so they are something more detailed than, than uh, Edges. Now you can see here that A, A must be the point of lowest mu of lowest Peron Frobenius value mu. Because otherwise, you couldn't transport things from a place which have more paths to a place which has fewer paths and get them back, right? So if you have a manifold which, is, uh, which has variable dimension like here, then the only place where, from which you could transport things on any path and come back is the place of smallest dimension, yes? So... Uh, and uh, uh, as, uh, and we'll get the answer in a theorem soon, but uh, the theorem is the following. So this is the lowest, uh, and this one is marked with a star. This is the furthest point on the D's and E's from the triple point. And uh, on the A as well. So uh, amazingly, uh, what I found was that uh, theorem, the AN and the D2N, uh, E6, E8, are flat d 2n plus 1 and uh, e7 are not flat. As a connection with operator algebras, the flat graph, for the flat graphs you have subfactors which give you that uh, that graph by bimodules. So there are inclusions which are characterized, the inclusions of low index, low Jones index, are characterized by such, uh, such data. And uh, there is no E7 and there are no D5 and, and further. Moreover, 
the flat part of d 2n plus 1 is a is a corresponding a with the same uh, and the flat part of d of e7 is d10 yes so this d to n plus 1 has index uh, 4n so it's, this is a 4n minus 1 what that means is that um, if you check which tensors come back to themselves they are not all the paths on the graph on the corresponding graph but they are the paths on the image of these image which was built by us with that connection if you remember that we mapped a graph into another graph yes So here you could put the image of this. <coughs> now, uh, Let me show you the connection with the, I mean, discuss a little bit the connection here with the, uh, uh, with the braiding. So we take now this braiding, which was, uh, so let me go back here to the topological we go back to TQFT, and there was a uh, pointed uh, question of Sruthi, who asked it actually more politely, uh, what were we doing when we switched from uh, TQFT to this, uh, to this combinatorial part? And what, what now we're coming back, what we needed was the data to fill the TQFT. So what we have here are some regions, let's call this A, A, and this one, uh, I don't know, let's call it E and F. These are just labels, which, uh, will, def which uh, uh, will be defined, well, will be called by us types. And uh, here A stands for AN uh, and uh, EF for any of the ADEs of same Coxeter number. Here N is N plus one. Exactly. These are labeling the two-dimensional regions. Uh, Chen Hao works on brains, and, uh, and uh, we're trying to see uh, the, the, corresp the exact correspondence between these boundary relations and what they do in, in string theory with brains. So as you see, this is labeling a boundary here, boundary region. Now, uh, an element of type A, so as you remember, the connections between A, between A and E, the connections were all labeled by vertices of E. So basically, they were labeled by E. So the, the connections between A and E give us a graph E. Yes? 
So the edges of this are connections. So they can be compute they can be constructed fairly explicitly. That's exactly what we did until now. The edges are connections. And uh, the uh, uh, the nodes here are intertwiners. If you have here A and B intertwiners, namely if you have an edge, uh, I mean if you, so A and B, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D are vertices of the graphs E or F. And uh, a, uh, if this is one here, then we'll have a, uh, uh, so this is an edge from A to B, from B to A. So this is a notation on the graph G. So every edge has become by this change of notation a triple point. Remember that this was, xi was in home from sigma one, then so this is here, one is sigma one, sigma one tensor A, B to A. such an edge, and here you have the home as a triple point. Yes, so these are really pairs of homes. Pairs of homes. When I did it, I think some physicist, Robert Cocoro, wrote a paper on this as, my, uh, as being my uh, double triangle algebra. So this is, these live in two triangles like this. So, The double triangle. Algebra. It's actually a double triangle Hopf algebra. Okay. And the question is, uh, uh, if we continue this, so if we go then to, uh, uh, let's say, we take now two, once here by putting two of them together. Then we, so once again, this, this lives in, so today you have to, uh, to uh, work uh, a little bit with the translation of the figures from one form to another. Yes, and uh, well, at the top, there's uh, what we are aiming for. I mean, maybe this is a math which, uh, which uh, is useful for quantum field theory. Not this one, but the one that we are building. So I won't cut it off now. When you write this, this is some sum of coefficient which can be computed quite easily. The coefficient, uh, and this is two or zero. Yes, well, this is one, one, because sigma one tends to sigma one decomposes into irreducibles, yes? So by and large, so this is sigma two, sigma zero, or sigma two, yes? Which is either trivial or the 3D. This is spin one or spin zero. Yes, so in general, in general, uh, we generate uh, precisely all the things of this form, where this is an N, and this stands for sigma N in the middle. So 
this sigma n is in e the irreducibles of uh, S u2, and this is of type AA. Yes, the objects of type AA are the irreducibles of SL2. And here we have, as usual, our, our two graphs, C and F. So the problem is how to, so this lives in this double triangle, yes? It is obviously diagonalized for the product from up to down, yes? Now this is a Hopf algebra which is neither commutative nor co-commutative. So it's neither abelian nor co-abelian. It's, it's, it's not a billion in any direction. So now what we would have to do is uh, to, um, to diagonalize this algebra in the other direction. Now there is a way to uh, uh, condense the whole representation theory in a sentence, if you want. Uh, the uh, functions on a group, for instance, form a Hopf algebra, a bigebra. So to do representation theory, you keep one of the laws of the bigebra and you diagonalize that one, neglecting the other one. So you keep only a part of it, which you diagonalize. And then the other part will give you the operations on the diagonalization, which in this case is a tensing of representations, yes? So representation theory it means you uh, choose one of the bigebra laws, diagonalize it, and now of course if it's a continuous group there are cases when it cannot be really diagonalized when you have subfactors. These were seen by, uh, uh, when you have von Neumann algebras as intertwiners, these were seen by John von Neumann as commutators, but let's look here just at the finite dimensional case, diagonalize it, and then the other law will give a tensor product, maybe generalized a bit, of uh, of irreducibles. Yes, so you can diagonalize one of the two laws. Here, one of them is diagonalized, the vertical law. And now, what we would need is to diagonalize this one. Here we have an N now. And we need to find, this is a sum of some coefficient times and you see the entrances must remain the same. So in my original paper, these were thick, and these would be very thick. We didn't have color then, and uh, so we had to use this terminology. So these would be all the objects of type EF, yes? They would all be obtained by this block diagonalization. And let me show you the result here in the case of the uh, in the case of the ADs. Here's a result. And then I'll discuss a little bit the result and the way in which it is found. So the, uh, the coefficient here 
can be computed graphically, it is exactly the uh, original one, the original picture, with the new picture put outside. So you have here A, A, and this is your E and F. Yes, so you have to compute this, which is called a 6J symbol, because if you count the total number, uh, the number of edges, it is 6. 6J symbol. Uh, it lives on a tetrahedron, by the way. This is simply the image of the dual tetrahedron. Yes, so uh, this lives on a, on a tetrahedron like this. And this is your AA, and these are, this is your EF. And here you have the thin line N, and here you have the thicker lines AE, and so on. And here you have the very thick one. Yes, so this lives on a tetrahedron. And, uh, and now the problem was to compute this. I had the problem, you know, what could be this, this intertwiner? It's a very strange thing. And then the solution that I saw was visual. This was before that connection uh, was seen, namely that if this was of type AA, the outside as well, the 6J can be computed and uh, it's the usual one. So what we could do is try to put the outside in, namely to take this uh, circle with the thick lines outside and define it as define it like this one over the other yes mindless of the fact that these are of type EF EE maybe I was looking at the E in particular and uh, the, the insight here is of type A but we could define it this way using the braiding that we have. You see the braiding extends easily to N uh, uh, wires, so this is an N and an M, and, uh, uh, and we could put this, or we could put it the other way. We could put it on top. So this is put it behind or in front, put the outside. So outside, that was the idea. And then using this idea, we can start to see what's, uh, what's, what can go wrong with it. Uh, namely, uh, first of all, these, uh, so this would be, let's say, this would be, uh, we would call this the, the connection of positive, and this one would be the negative. And in the name that came out after that, this was a Cairo, Cairo left and Cairo right. And these are complex conjugate. because our connections are like that. So what could go wrong is the following. First of all, um, this may go quite fine, actually, for M is equal to one or two. Okay. But, uh, sigma, but uh, the outside, the double edge M 
and let's call this M, uh, this was a, uh, the one on top of it. This is N plus and then minus, but N plus may not be irreducible. And look at the things on top here. Each of them starts, let me uh, go here, this is an E6, do you see? It starts here. This is a generator, the one with a flag, with a red flag. This is a generator that we just put on the blackboard. That's a connection with one over the other, yes? And the blue is the other generator the complex conjugate. So these are the ones which we put on the blackboard monthly. Do you see here what happens? Uh, one wire is okay, two wires are still irreducible, but the third, the one of degree three, breaks in two. Can you see? Yes? So what this means in terms of intertwiners is that you have a, you have a uh, a self-intertwine of degree six. This is Schulz's lemma that if uh, if you have a map from alpha to from sigma k to sigma k, which breaks it in two, then there's a map from the identity to sigma k tends to sigma k bar, and that can lie only in sigma two k. Yes. So there's a nice intertwiner. And this intertwiner, as you see, appears here, appeared here as modular invariant in the matrix of modular invariants, which was put up by physicists, uh, Itzikson, Capelli, Zuber. They put, uh, they found uh, a modular invariant, which uh, I don't have time now to, uh, to discuss, uh, but uh, as you see, the, I think I discussed it maybe in the first lesson. I'll bring it back again. There is a, uh, there is a, a representation of the modular group. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, uh, made by Hurwitz. And uh, what you see here are the intertwiners of that, self-intertwiners of that representation. So there's one in every dimension n. The uh, T transformation, which is a rotation by 90 degrees, goes into basically the Fourier transform of Z mod n. And T is diagonal, it's a Gaussian, uh, the uh, square power of the element on the diagonal. And as you can see here on the diagonal, these are exactly the exponents of E6 that we have discussed. So this was the only piece, the only thing that was uh, not understood about it at the moment. And Dietzikson, Capelli, and Zuber uh, said in their paper that the interpretation of the off-diagonal terms was left to the future. So um, I published this in, uh, in a paper called uh, um, pass on Coxeter graphs, uh, a series of 20 hours of lectures at the Fields Institute around 90, in the late 1990s, I, around 1995, I think, or so. So uh, what you can see here, this one is interpreted now as the one that breaks E6 in two. So there's another, there can be another uh, uh, another thing that happens, remember I was, we were studying what can happen with those, uh, with the, this definition. So one was that these were no, not all irreducible. And for, uh, so after a while, they break into pieces. And the second part is that, uh, the second thing that can happen is that uh, the chiral plus, plus and minus may have things in common, may have objects in common. And you can see there on the graph of E6, sorry, you should have told me that the E6 was a little bit off the 
Yes. You can see here on the graph of E6 that there are some things in common. These I call the ambichirals. These are both in the chiral plus and in the chiral minus. And now the theorem is the following. The uh, Right. Right. So what we want is to find all the objects of all the types. Thank you. That's actually a very good question. Yes, the point is that you have a, so let me, uh, let me uh, uh, do just that before the theorem. I think I have time to put two theorems on the blackboard, so which is. Absolutely, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the main point. So uh, given a TQFT, uh, this is a, a 2D, 3D TQFT, the usual one, with objects labeled as AA. This is just some arbitrary label so we have objects of type AA. The question is find, find all types which are labels B, C, and so on. So objects with objects, now we didn't have we, we should have objects of type A, B, uh, B, C, B, B, etc. So we should have objects of all types. We should have homes of all types. And we should, we should have zeta in all tetrahedra. The uh, evaluation of tetrahedra so that the, uh, the uh, TQFT uh, definitions work with any label, choice of labels. And we ask for the following uh, properties that if you have an object AB, so if you tensor AB with BAs like this, so if you have an XAB tensor with YBA should decompose into the given objects of type AA. So any tensor should decompose. So when you have, so this, this by the way, this is uh, 
So we have constructed such an example exactly with our maps between, so the objects X of type BC are exactly the connections B to C, which is what we have done in the first part of the semester. Yes, so we have such objects. It's not a, an abstract thing. So this is a condition number one, and the condition number two is that there should be no object X of type BB, these are the same, which is invertible. Or with mu of X equal to one. That's because that would be then the label uh, excuse me, uh, uh, this is wrong, of B, C, let's put, and not the same. Yes, so there should be no object of two labels which are not the same, which is invertible, else, this is a motivation, else you, you could take any Y, BB and tensor it with X bar and with X here and map it to Y prime of type CC. So if you had an invertible object, then the, the two labels would not really be different. You could just tensor and call them uh, something else. And in this case, you have a multiplicative distance between the vertices B and C, which is the uh, size, the minimum of the size of any X of type B C. So if you want the usual notion of distance, you take the log of this. And this, these labels are called the maximal atlas. I call them the maximal atlas. Are the labels of type A, B, C, and so on as above, and all the objects. And uh, the main theorem, which are, will be proved, but in the book, in the in uh, discussions after the the uh, class, is that this if if the theory, if uh, there are finitely many AAs objects of type AAs, the maximal atlas is finite. So in our case, let me write here, for a given N, the maximal atlas has all vertices the ADEs with coxeter N. So uh, the biggest one is, non-trivial one is, uh, if you have here A29, D16, and E8. <laughs> so
So theorem in the last uh, minute, we still uh, the theorem here is that the flat part of the ADE graphs of the connection of the connection plus chiral left is the chiral left graph generated by this connection. So what you see there in thick red is a part generated by the red, by the red generator. You see the ge red generator with a flag it generates a red graph and the uh, and uh, let me lower the screen here this is a most interesting case you can see here that the le chiral left part of d10 is of uh, e7 here so the connections of E7 of type E7 E7 are the the chiral part is D10 uh, with a very unusual thing. Remember that the the A and uh, dimensions grow in the middle. The D the leg of D is exactly half the maximum dimension of A, and only for D10 uh, you can switch the D10 even. By to uh, so there is a, 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 a the conjugate of this connection is this one. So the conjugate of the neck of the D10 is a leg of the D10, which is you can see the D10 in red here. So the the uh, flat part of E7, if you start to move pass around on, on E7, you find D10. And you find this D10 with this twist. So, uh, uh, and uh, the connection here, just as a last word, this is the uh, this is here the uh, uh, the modular invariant found by Isix on Capelli and Zuber for E7. And uh, what you can see here is exactly this was a theorem. Uh, that I wanted to put uh, in that the modular invariant, the first uh, uh, interpretation of it is it counts exactly the number of ways to go from the origin, from the star, to an ambichiral path by an essential path and return by an essential path back. So you can see here that you can go in two steps up to this point two on the red graph and then return back in a big number of steps, about eight or so. This is exactly this one here. Yes. So the first interpretation of the modular invariant is that, uh, is that it, it tells you in this graph exactly what is connected to what. So, um, and I shall stop here.